had no ink. The other printer had no paper. It's like, <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh. Good And welcome to today's garden class here at Waters Garden Center. Welcome everyone. So today's class is on edible landscapes, specifically um, fruit trees, berries, grapes, the bigger things. We could touch on some of the others, like I'm getting tomatoes off my plants right now. Some folks are, I think we had to touch on that because we're in this pivot point with tomatoes. If you're growing tomatoes, I can help you get more tomatoes. So I can just a real quick trip to tips that can help up your game like immediately. You're not allowed to do that anymore, coughing it out loud. So anyway, this uh, my name is Ken Lane. I'm glad that you joined us online. Uh, I am the owner of the garden center. So I've, been, I've owned the garden center since 2002. It's been 20 years, I can't believe that. So my father-in-law, Harold Waters, owned it 30, 40 years before that. So 1962, he started the garden center. And so uh, uh, we've just had this family for 60 years now. This is 60, this is 60 years, it's hard to believe that. Um, and my daughter is training. Uh, that's part of the reason we're going to Orlando, Florida tomorrow. It's an industry get together. It's all the biggest retailers in the country gather in Orlando just to help each other kind of get smarter, how do you get better. In a small town, it can be kind of challenging to get new ideas you got to go outside your market area and kind of go hang out with other smart people and you all of a sudden you just up your game. That's kind of how we do it. But she's in training for that as well. So hopefully she can take it and run it for another 20, 30 years is the goal. So we are in very good uh, fruit and berry country here. And it's because of the four seasons. It really takes four seasons to, to have good fruit production. Uh, herbs grow better here than anywhere else in the country because it's bright. It's dry, except for today, it's kind of humid, but it's typically dry. In fact, I think I saw a flood warning come up. So isn't it nice to have flood warnings all of a sudden? Did you see yesterday's news? Las Vegas, like the casinos are filling with water. It's like, good, they need that. Like you can't drive through the streets of Vegas without uh, driving through like four foot of water. Hopefully it all goes into Lake Mead and uh, we don't have to find any more bodies at the bottom of the lake again. So anyway, that's, we need the rain. Uh, but the humidity kind of gets to me sometimes, but your plants love it. Unfortunately, so do some of the bugs and some of the disease. And so I've got a couple examples. I found spittle bug on one of the grapes. It's, we were gonna spray it this morning. I went, oh, whoa, whoa, that's perfect for the class. Wait, let me show the students and then we'll spray it. As so I'll show you what kind of what to look for on certain things, how to, how to solve some of that. And then if we get time, I think we'll get some time. Uh, I've got some new plants, just how to beat inflation at a garden center. I'll teach you how to do that. So there are some tricks to it. And so there is inflation going on, but there's ways to kind of work the system and you win. So, and it's just buying at the right season. So let's start, shall we? Let's start with, let's start with berries because the berry production is really heavy right now. So I'm, every day I can go out and eat blackberries and raspberries. Let me just go out and I'll take the grandkids out. We will gorge ourselves until our face and our hands are just black with blackberries. You can have that kind of production 
with just a few just a few berry plants. It doesn't take very much. I say if you don't know where to start with berries, start with blackberries, then go to boysenberries, marionberries, which are basically blackberry variations. They're super easy to grow. Raspberries, there are some very good productions of raspberries. It's surprising how well raspberries do here. And the last one to kind of start with, and everyone wants to start with blueberries, especially my Midwest folks. I'm from Minnesota. I grew berries when I was, you know, well, it's not Minnesota anymore, Toto. This is, uh, it's a little harder. Uh, blueberries are, are, I never tell gardeners what they can or cannot grow because they'll find a way to do it. Uh, but they're kind of more challenging because they like more acid, acidy kind of soils. And so I'll share you a few tricks. I grow blueberries. You can have them. They won't be quite as big as you're used to, maybe from the Midwest, but they're sweeter. But I'll show you some tips on how to do that. Um, I would say blackberries, a little trick here. I got some right here. This is a, this is probably one of my favorite thornless blackberries. You can actually pick this and you don't feel like you've been in a cat. Oops, my staff always hates it when I go show and tell with plants. Um, you don't look like you've been in a cat fight, but it still forms a very large, very sweet berry. Here's a little tip on all your berries. It's kind of insider scoop. My name's Ken. We're just friends. We're talking over the back fence. This works for me. I think it'll work really well for you too. Um, birds like berries too. They like them as much as you do. What I'm doing right now, because the berries are just forming, you know, the berries form at the very tip, they form, they, they ripen first and the rest of them down that cane start to ripen. And so I'm picking those off and eating those, enjoying them, but I'm putting scare tape on those canes that have berries on them right now. I'm doing it for two reasons. Mainly right now, this is reflective tape. It's red on one side, um, kind of silver on the back, and kind of flutters and freaks the birds out because they're kind of skittish. Um, I'll wait until the first berries are just starting to form so they don't get used to this flittering tape. I'll kind of strategically wait until, because they're looking at them too going, I can't wait till they're ripe, I can't wait, I just can't wait, just like you are. And so I'll put it on right then, and I'll put about a strip about maybe two or three feet long. Um, and it does keep the birds off the berries, they won't bother them. I will keep this tape on, this stuff is really cheap. I'll keep this on that vine until I prune it off in winter. Here's an insider tip on berries. They put the best, biggest, most production of berries on last year's cane. So they're fruiting up right now on last year's new growth. So they'll send off 12, 15 foot canes out there. I mean, they're really long, they're very aggressive. You can almost watch them grow by the day. The ones that are growing right now don't have berries, or if they do, very limited. So I'm gonna to wanna to prune this thing back, otherwise this bramble takes over the entire backyard. And it can literally be, from me to you, it's as big as this group. One, one, one cane, one vine can be that aggressive. I've got mine up against a fence where I want it to stay there, maybe within five, six feet of the fence. And I don't want it coming out to you know, grab me as I go walk by. And so I'm strategically tying those canes back and pruning them out so that I keep this thing under control. So every winter, January, February, March, is when you prune most of your edible things. I'm pruning, that, I'm pruning back my berries. How do you know which canes to prune out? I'm just looking for the scare tape. Because if this year's, um, this year's production is not going to produce nearly as well as next year, as it did this year. So I'm always trying to get new canes, always trying to get new canes. It's kind of like roses. Roses, you get the best flowers on that bright new cane coming up. That's where you get the big flowers. That old, overgrown, kind of barky, trunky type of cane, those don't put on, they're smaller flowers if they bloom at all. Uh, berries are exactly the same way. They're kind of unique in that way. So you can increase your production simply by a pruning technique. And this is how I identify which ones? Because you'll forget in winter, you'll be going, which one had the berries? I don't remember. Well, this kind of goes, click, I just know which ones. I print it right back down to the ground, print it out, then I'll fertilize it in March. It starts to grow like crazy. And by now, you're starting to, to eat. And I'll, I'll eat berries from now through October, first part of October or so. So it's two, three months worth of berry production. It's pretty easy to do. 
Okay, that's the insider tip I gave you for that. And that's for raspberries, blackberries, boysenberries, marionberries. If it has the word berry on it, except blueberry, blueberries are different. They're more of a shrub, not a, not a bramble. So on how they grow, but that's a really good trick for, for your berries. Um, they are heavy feeders. You'll find that your soil is not very good here. It's not very good for production. So I do fertilize my berries typically three times a year. I'll start it in March, Easter, 4th of July, Halloween. If you just think of those holidays, if you fertilize on or, or around that time frame, you'll get more, you'll get more berries, larger berries, uh, increased production. You get an extra basket full of berries just by that. If you don't do that, what happens is they get kind of wimp, they get uh, real thin, that they don't have as much foliage on them. They'll still grow this real long cane, but they're just wispier. And they just don't have as much um, leaf count to create the photosynthesis to make the sugars, to make the berries. So it's like a, tr 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 a trickle down effect. If you fertilize it, it keeps it looking full like that. That's just kind of, just three times a year. What I'm fertilizing with, this is what I use. Fruit and vegetable food. The reason I'm using this one is organic. So my, my, actually all of our foods, not all of them, all the foods that we make, I can't say that, most of the, all the granular foods that we make are all organic or natural. This one we made to increase the size of your fruits and berries, uh, apples, plums, things that are edible. So what, what this is, it's 6447, it's 7% 7 calcium. We purposely put a lot of calcium into this. We have, a, we have a lack of calcium in our soil and you'll get blossom end rot on tomatoes, your peppers, your fruits will be smaller. Calcium also brings the flavor out, gets you that depth of flavor that you'll get uh, like you can only get when you're harvesting on, on, a, on, a, on a vine or, or a tree or shrub, whatever. It just is made for our plants here to bring out more fruits for you. If you happen to have all-purpose plant food, that 744, that's our original food. We sold, I made that 20 years ago. I like, I like the chemistry of, of gardening. I like tr trying to figure out how to make them happier. So that one will work too. That one's mainly got cottonseed meal. It doesn't have nearly as much calcium. So this one's, this one's made specifically for fruiting plants. I'll do this in, in, at Easter, usually March. I know Easter slides back and forth quite a bit, but sometime in the spring, the daffodils are blooming, you know, the crab apples are in bloom. You know in springs here, you're going, oh, I've been pent up too long. I'm tired of baking cookies and sipping tea inside. You want to go out, that's your cue. Your plants want to wake up then too. I'll fertilize the end of June or July because I know the rains are coming. We never know how much rain is coming. This year's been pretty good. Hopefully it will last. You never know. But I know rain's coming. I know humidity goes up. I know we'll get some. And there's this growth spurt that happens right now. This is really important for your fast-growing heavy feeders, berries, grapes. Um, I would even say fruit trees because you've harvested by now the uh, peaches, apricots, nectarines, all the, all the pitted fruits have kind of been harvested by now. If you can fertilize now, you can actually get more growth, more roots, more. You can increase. You're setting the stage for next spring's, summer's harvest. So the, you just don't fertilize enough. This is hard for you Midwest folks to realize. You're just not used to fertilizing ever. You got eight foot of topsoil, and they just say, you never have to fertilize at all. I mean, if you do once, you're fine. Here, you don't have anything in your soil. I mean, the, the eight millimeters of topsoil you had was scraped off to make room for your footers and your driveways and your, it, it just, it's, you, you, some of you are literally gardening in dead soil. And so to amend some of that, fertilize more often, is really critical. Already a question from the back row of all things. But I love your shirt. Is that, I love gardening. I, that is awesome. Like, all you gardeners are, are the same. That's awesome. Yeah, what's up? Um, you mentioned your source for the main part of cotton meal. Yeah. Sure, the three times are Easter, 4th of July, Independence Day. And the most important feeding for all edible things, October, fall feeding. It's taking that food, it's storing that up, and then it's going to use that to force next spring's growth. So it's using that. If you get a harsh winter, it'll go through that harsh winter much better. This is important for everything in the yard. 
I would say especially evergreens, because you only get one shot at evergreens uh, of growth. They put on that candle growth, and then that's it. Whatever you get, that's locked in. And so you can really make a difference by adding food in the fall for that spring growth. It's a game changer. And then as far as what the elements are, I'll let you read the label. Those are all up here. It's all spread out. I mean, legally, I got to go, here's what it is, by percentage, tells you all that kind of stuff. So, okay. Anything else? It's a good, good question. So I don't know if you heard, she asked, uh, sorry about that. When do you fertilize again and what's in the label? There you go. Pot, tea, meal, bird, guano, iron, sulfur, that kind of stuff. Let's go to grapes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so she's got a pear tree. She bought this year. Is it going to bear fruit this year? No. It would already have fruits on it. Probably about that big. Most of the fruits got dinged this year. Remember that frost late mid to late April, there was, a, there was an April heavy, it wasn't just a frost. It was a bitter, deep freeze. And it killed some plants even, it was so cold. But it did take out your buds. And so uh, we're seeing some apples, a few pears, all the pitted fruits were taken this year. Because they were all, they were some, like the apricots, they were in full bloom. Nectarines were in full bloom when that thing hit. And so it just took them all. And so that happens sometimes. We'll go over which fruit trees to start with after grapes, though. Let's start with that. So I'll come back to you. So this year, no. Next year, set the stage. Again, for pears, fertilize in the fall. That'll help you with next, you know, they, those typically bloom in April. That'll help you get more blooms, more fruit set, more that way. We are, we do surprisingly well with grapes up here. You wouldn't think that, this elevation. Uh, you think of that more at the lower elevations, but if you get the hardier varieties, there are some grapes that will take the cold better than the others. Uh, get the ones that are colder. If, if in doubt, buy your grapes from Waters Garden Center. There you go, because we only carry the ones that are for here. We're going to stay away from those desert varieties. But unfortunately, we have a lot of influence from the buyers down in the valley. They're going, ah, oh, ship 50 of those to all my stores, and you see all these varieties that shouldn't be up here showing up. So kind of do your homework a little bit. Uh, but, but Thompson's, Flames, there's a whole series of them that are really great, including some, some vineyard like grapes, like, uh, like uh, wine grapes. You can grow those up here very, very well. So my grapes right now, I grow Flame. Pers this is my personally. I grow Flame, which is more of a red. I wanted a red grape. I wanted a green grape. And so I've got Thompson's, or, or I, actually it's um, Niagara. Niger, anyway, it's not, it starts with an N. I, I think it's Niagara and Flame are the two I grow personally, and they're heavy producers, seedless table grapes, because I just want to go out. I like teaching the grandkids how to pick fruits from the, from the yard. Every time they show up, they go, Pop, Pop, can we go eat from the yard? It's January. I'm going, there's nothing out there. We'll go find some random potato or some leftover radish that we can eat, or we'll pick some parsley or kale or something. So it really, there's always something you can have going. But, you know, this time of year, it's exciting because you're, in you're into the harvest from now through autumn. You're in the harvest time. And so grapes, typically your late summer, autumn is when you're harvesting grapes. What I find for myself, this is my experience, and your gardeners, you're, this is a hardcore gardener class. Um, I find my berries are, are, my grapes are a little bit smaller, but they're sweeter than other areas. They have a, they have a zing, they just have more concentrated sugar count. I do find I need to fertilize more often. I'm fertilizing every couple of months my grapes. I find that keeps them healthier, so I'll give them a handful of this, all, the, the, the fruit and vegetable food. I'll just put a handful of that down. And it seems to keep them green, keep them growing, keep them going. Increases my production. Again, the benefit of organics, too, is they break down really slow. So the plants take up virtually all of that nutrient Whereas a chemical food, most of that's lost. It just, it just, when you get heavy rain, it liquefies and just runs down, runs across the yard. So most of that's not even picked up by the plant. Organics stay there. The plants can pick it up better. So the numbers are smaller, but they use it all. Whereas your bigger numbers, like a 10, 10, 10, or, and you know what they are, chemical based, the petroleum based products, like the Scots kind of stuff. Most of those, of those are released in 30 days and most of it's lost by the plant. Organics are better. And you know where you find your best organics? 
here at Waters Garden Center. Yeah, yeah, very good. You're hired. If you, need, if you get bored in retirement, you come work for me. We'll put you an apron on you right up there and go, here. <laughs> I love it. We actually have a whole retirement team that just comes in. I mean, I have one guy, Kevin. He's a joy to work with. Shows up on time. Works really hard. But he was the, for clear radio or something, he ran Asia. I mean, he's just here, retired here, and now he's selling petunias and grapes. I mean, it just... He's fun to be around. So we get a whole bunch of folks like that. Anyway, with this, so grapes get super confusing. If you're researching online what to do with a grape, you will be dumbfounded. You just don't even know what to do. I don't, I think we can change how we're, how we're, we're not after extra bushels per acre here. We're not after, we're not, we're not, we're not agriculture. We're beauty, we're secret gardens, we're butterflies and hummingbirds. We want to relax and watch a sunset with our grapes. It can be not just increased production. For me, I've got six foot fences around the yard. They're cedar fences. They blend in with the surrounding chaparral. Uh, but still, it feels like I'm caged in. I mean, fencing makes you feel caged in, much less brick. I mean, you're using cinder blocks. I mean, that's like Russians, like prison block. That's what that is. You got to soften the thing up and make it feel more just softer and grapes are a great way to do that uh, arbors pergolas i've literally grown a grape up two stories up a, up a deck and then up a pergola over the deck and it covered and shaded the entire deck it can grow that much now did i sacrifice some of my production yes i didn't get as many grapes i still got a lot of grapes but i was after the shade and the look that mediterranean kind of look is after the style, and then if I got some grapes, that was a bonus, which I did. So for my current current yard, six foot fence, I want to I want to I want to soften that up. I don't want to see the fence, and so I have my canes come up to the top of the fence, and then I tee it off. I can still see the cedar fence, so I've got a double tee. This is not how they teach you to prune to prune grapes. Usually they say four foot tee off and have it go down barbed wire fence, basically. Most of us don't have barbed wire fences of four feet. We want so we have something else. And so I think it's okay to modify what looks good to you, and you'll still get grapes. It's not going to make that big a difference. And so I've got a double T, one at the top of the fence, one halfway down. And then I run the canes, I run the, the, those tendrils across the top of the fence, and I get very heavy production. It's now about this far above the fence, two, three feet, and then it just kind of goes and spills over. And at this point, it's turning into a jungle, and there's just grapes, grape leaves everywhere, which means you get bigger clusters of grapes. Again, these are sugar-making factories. The more foliage you get, the more, the bigger, the more the grapes you get. And this is a really good year for grapes and berries because they love this type of, this type of uh, humid moisture, Kind of stuff. I've not modified my irrigation yet. I'm still at that June level because I'm trying to rehydrate my soil. It was so bone dry in June. I was planting some things and literally there was zero moisture in the soil. So it's going to take a while before that, before it's going to take a lot of rain for that to rehydrate the surrounding soil. So I'll probably go another couple of weeks, a couple of storms, kind of modify. I've got to, I've got to plant a hosta in my yard, I'll see how the soil is, how, how dry it is. I'm gonna plant a catnip for the cat. Anyway, gardeners, you know how we are. Just for the cat, it's an ugly plant, but I'm doing it for the family. And so I'll plant that out. I'll see how, how the soil is and I'll make a judgment call. Then I'll start throttling back and I'll go an extra day in between water cycles and try to reduce my water. But right now I'm trying to front load, getting more moisture into the soil, it's just me. Some folks see one storm and they go, oh, I could cut back my irrigation. It stresses out the plants. Okay, so with this, I brought this one up specifically, and I don't know if you can get this on the camera, but uh, this has spittlebug, which is an awesome example. This will show up right here. There's a little tiny insect. Can you see that right there? It looks like, looks like someone hawked a loogie on that. It shows up on, uh, uh, they really like the taste of salvia or autumn sage, you'll see this showing up. So this is the first This is the first day it showed up here at the garden center. And we're kind of the canary in the gold coal mine. We'll see how customers come in. And once we see that wave coming in of customers, going spittlebug, 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 uh, we'll put the word out going, look for this. Right now, it's a bit early. You just share it with folks that come to your class. You kind of want your friends to know ahead of everyone else 
just a spittle bug. Underneath this gooey, gross thing, you'll see a little tiny brown. Ew, that's disgusting. That's anyway, you'll see a brown, little tiny. There he is. You see a little tiny brown bug. Yeah, come out of there. Come on. Anyway, you wouldn't see it anyway. Yeah. See, this will this will teach you to sit in the front row. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Spittlebug, really, thank you, Ken. Appreciate that. Really easy to kill off, really easy to take care of, really easy to you just gotta keep be aware of it. Here, we're just gonna take the triple action. This is neem oil. We're just gonna spray those guys. When, once I get a bottle that's already opened. We'll spray them after the class, and that'll take them right out. And then we'll keep a close eye on, on the other things we know they're going to come after. So it's a little tiny flying insect, laser eggs. They kind of come out. And it's, this is a, a defense to keep the praying mantis, wasps, and birds off of them. So ladybugs, things that are predators, they're doing that as a defense to keep them. They're hiding underneath this goo to protect them. But they're sucking the life out of your, out of your plant. And they're, just, uh, they're disgusting. They deserve to die. That's just it. Spittlebug. Normally I don't show gross things at the class, but that's super interesting. You get to see the weird stuff. So, yeah. So, do deer and javelina like to eat grapes? They can. Deer can, can do that sometimes. Javelina, no. I guess they would if they could reach the grapes, but generally you're going to keep those up a little higher than they can get to. Um, that being said, you can grow grapes. They'll actually grow to the ground and grow in between rocks. They naturally, natively grow in between the rocks and boulders. If there were, they could get them. Maybe they might. Uh, grapes, if the deer eat a few grapes, I think that's fine. They're growing so aggressively, so fast, they'll recover. They can't, they can't eat enough to do enough damage. I think you're okay. Same with berries. I don't find they get into berries too much. Every once in a while, they can eat them. Uh, but generally, they've got defenses. I don't know the difference between thornless and thorned. Thorn, the reason berries have thorns is to protect themselves, probably from humans. They probably did that in response going, these people keep eating all my seed that I want to reproduce with. I'm going to put thorns so they'll stop doing that. So you, I, I still have a few rashes from pruning up the raspberries and stuff because they got thorns on them. So be gentle. But generally, that'll also keep the, the animals out. So same with herbs. Animals don't eat herbs. What the deer really like, they can't resist fruit trees. They like fruit trees. So there you'll have to protect your fruit trees until they get established enough, until they get big enough. And then they'll kind of, they'll just stand up on their hind legs and nibble up to about this high, just about where you can walk underneath it. It's like it's perfectly pruned underneath where you can drive the tractor. You can walk underneath it without dinging your head, uh, you know, on an apple limb. So it just depends on where you're at. So elk, same way. So we've got some elk herds up at Copper Basin, um, Baghdad, Skull Valley. There's a couple herds starting to show up. They'll love to eat your fruit trees. That's one to watch. Yep. I wanted to harvest the grape seeds for yeah. culinary purposes. Yeah. How much can you do it without harming the plant? Oh, that's a good question, actually. And I don't know the answer. So her question was, for you folks online, we're not ignoring you. We know you're there. If you got a question, type it in. Also, the handouts. Oh, I should go over the handouts. Bear with me. I've got two handouts today. One. Yeah. What? What's? Blueberries. Oh, blueberries. Yeah, gotcha. Um, one is uh, the, the fruit tree pollination chart. We'll go over fruit trees here in a second, but which ones pollinate each other? We've set up some charts. Those will be in your inbox here shortly. Uh, the other one is, what was the other one, Ken, that I did? I forgot. I gave them to you early. Oh, yeah, cooking with herbs. We have a chef friend of mine um, who teaches some class sometimes, and she goes, here's how I use my fresh herbs. And she put some recipes for pesto. Uh, you all would like that. That would be good. And so we'll get that. If, give me your, your email address. I kind of put name, your first and last name plus email, just because last time some of you have terrible handwriting, and I cannot interpret what you're trying for me to put. And so the first one, many of you have such, I can kind of interpret. So kind of give me both if you show there, but that'll be in your inbox, be a PDF. You can just download and print out as you choose and use them, share it with friends. We just, it's free. We want you to be better gardeners. We're trying to teach gardening is what we're doing. Back to you. How many grapes 
grape leaves can I harvest uh, without damaging the grape? I think you could probably have as many as you want, especially if you're fertilizing, because you're gonna pick a leaf off and it's gonna reform a leaf just like that. Maybe not in that same spot, but it'll push out more foliage. It's gonna to try to compensate. So unless you're stripping the whole thing off, I would say, just to give you a percentage, no more than 25% of the foliage mass picked off at one time. Does that help you? It could be a lot before it starts to affect. Yeah. Caterpillars come in and take a bunch off, and then I was like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's great leaf skeletonizer. Aren't they a beautiful caterpillar? It's got striped black and yellow. Yeah, great leaf skeletonizer, very common. So she had uh, little tiny caterpillars, they'll form a little butterfly, lay some eggs, and then they like the taste of grapes. And so they'll be really tiny and they'll kind of be this little colony on, on foliage, but they grow really quick. And so they'll quickly get out there and they'll strip the foliage off the plant. So pretty easy to spot because you'll see the, the grape leaf will be like have these holes. They'll strip off all the foliage except for the veins. You know, oh, I've got grape leaf skeletonizer. I've got plenty, I've seen them so many times, but it's good to know they're out there. Here's the first one I've heard that's, that's, that's starting to respond to the damage. So this is our time. This time of year is when we see a lot of leaf spot. Uh, everything is growing fast right now. Plants and bugs, everything is growing fast. So you gotta kind of be out there looking for things. Spittle bug. I don't know how bad this will be in the community. It can be every plant will have spittle on it. And it can be, this is the only one we'll see all season. You don't know until you get into it to see how active the insects have been laying their eggs around. So we're kind of this mecca where all the insects are attracted to us, but we have teams of people that are professionals that just kind of watch for that. Watering, bugs, that kind of stuff. Let's go over, uh, are we done with grapes? You think we got it? So I would say two with grapes. If you could try to keep the, the foliage on top of the clusters, let it shade the fruits so don't harvest those on top. So I've, I've got dear Greek friends, you love going to their house and they're always gonna have something stuffed in grapes. I mean, it just, it just melts in your mouth, you just, oh my gosh. So there, I, mean, I would say don't harvest the ones over the fruit clusters that it helps protect, keep the sun off, you'll get larger fruits, okay? Just some insider tips. Herbs, most herbs up here are perennial. You plant them once, they keep growing over and over and over again. A couple exceptions, basil is an annual. It's just, it's gonna flame out in winter, it's gonna get burned back. Sometimes it can reseed and come back by seed, but it's not gonna come back by that root. So definition of a perennial is the plant comes back, rests underneath the ground, it will come back fresh each spring from the roots, not a seed. Seeds are typically annuals. Uh, cilantro, cannabis, sometimes it'll come back, Usually it's an annual, but your basil, uh, sage, lavender, rosemary, mints. There's so many mints. Mints is an aggressive weed. I wouldn't put that right in the middle of my yard. It, your whole yard would be nothing but chocolate mint or raspberry mint or whatever your mint is. So I try to keep it in pots and little tiny raised beds where I kind of con contain it down here. Um, a couple things, too. I brought this one up. So you rosemary specifically for us here at the higher elevations. So this is good. This is a good rosemary state, but there's probably 50 different kinds of rosemaries. It's a big family of plants from all over the Mediterranean. And so some are hardier than others as far as the cold goes. It's the winter that will burn them back. And so um, this is really important for your ground cover type of rosemaries. So really you just want um, ARP, Huntington carpet, those are really the only two that are really hardy up here. All the other ones are made for Phoenix and they'll burn out on you. So just kind of be aware, be careful, watch. If you've had some problems in the past, you probably got the wrong variety. It wasn't you. You were probably sold a bill of goods. It, it's, it, you, it's not your thumbs are brown. It's you sold the wrong plant. You didn't stand a chance. So the upright varieties are a little more, there's a more fudge factor, mainly because they're so big. They protect themselves. They kind of keep the... They just kind of keep the frost off the heart of the plant better. The lower ones, they're more exposed. Their roots can be damaged more. So there's some that are just have more antifreeze in them than others. So just kind of bring that up. Uh, all of them, ground cover or upright, they're all good for, for the kitchen. 
They're all good. One of my favorites is this uh, barbecue. You see these pretty on these long spikes. So this is barbecue rosemary. This gets up about like this big. It's a shrub, uh, but it puts on long tendrils. And I love harvesting those and then picking off, taking the, uh, uh, the foliage off the stems. And I use them as skewers, especially for chicken and pork, that kind of stuff. Oh, and it roasts from the inside out to the, uh, uh, the flavor just makes it so good. And then you go on and impress friends and family. <laughs> yeah, I picked this in the yard and I use it as a skewer. Come on, that's a gardener thing. I mean, you gotta be impressed with that. But barbecue does really well. Tuscan blue, if in doubt, buy your rosemary from Waters Garden Center. We're only gonna sell the varieties that, that, that grow up here. We're specifically, that's we, we know you're coming here for plants that are gonna succeed and you're willing to pay a couple dollars more for a better plant and get more for the for the money. That's we feel that pressure all the time. So and we load them up with uh, we put mycorrhizal fungi, beneficial fungi in the water, so that every plant in the yard gets these beneficials. Because we know you don't have any of that. There's no worms. There's nothing good in your yard. We're trying to help seed this good stuff the plants feed off of. And micro, mycorrhizals attach themselves to the roots so they extend out so they make a larger root mass. So you get more, you get a hardier plant in a, in a bright summer, let's say June, it helps the plant grow. So anyway, herbs. I brought a sage. Oh, you're gonna go off on me on mycorrhizals, aren't you? I love it, I can go, I can go tit for tat for you. Actually, no, I, I'm <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Don't buy bait shot work. Yeah. So your question is, do we buy? Do we sell worms? Yes, we sell worms. We sell ladybugs. I bought ladybugs. Um, yeah, we sell all that kind of stuff. The problem with the nightcrawler stuff, the great big fishing worms, get the red, red. Yeah, you want the red ones, the small ones. Otherwise, the big ones just tear up your yard, and they just. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> right now it's snails. So it rained last night in my gardens and all the snails are going, I'm going to make a break for it across the driveway. I'm going, no, you aren't. Screech, you're out of there. So uh, uh, they were all out last night. So I, it looks like I need to put some bait out for them. So there's some organic iron based baits for, for snails and slugs. But they'll eat your gardens and you don't see them until it's rainy out. They come out. Same with worms. You don't see them until they start, they start, to drown, they come out. You see them all over the yard. But yes, you can add worms. We have worm castings. We have a local uh, worm farmer that we get the castings from. Again, you think gardeners are funky. Worm farmers are really interesting people. So anyway, uh, uh, an idea on sage. So I love herbs. A lot of them are evergreen. And so sage is one of those. Uh, uh, rosemary is evergreen. Lavender is evergreen. Uh, a lot of them are, are, will keep their foliage and look pretty good. And so I like the variegated variety. Now your culinary sage is typically that blue one. This one's got some bright color to it, some variegation, but it has the same flavor. If you want to use it in the kitchen, same flavor, but it's bright and pretty and just different and unusual. Then you can mix with the, these with like, uh, I don't know if I got anything, but you just mix it with pretty flowers and just, I can mix my herbs with flowers and I can have both beauty and edible in the same gardens, especially with container gardens, raised beds, that kind of stuff. Don't feel like you got to do it the way your grandparents did. They, the plants much, must march across the yard in straight lines and salute you as you go by. We're much more informal gardeners anymore. And so I blend tomatoes with my flowers often, uh, just, just for beauty. In my raised beds, I'll train the tomatoes, some of the trailing things to go over the edge and it's not as pretty as flowers or let's say a, a vine or, or a, a rose, but it's edible and I wanted edibles there. And so I just, I combine the two. And when the grandkids come over, they are awestruck. Going, oh my gosh, look what Papa did. I can't believe he can do that. Yeah, it's so easy. Another one for you and then I'll let herbs go. Um, uh, lavenders do really well here. If you're gonna kill lavender, it's gonna be from overwatering or soil that's just too soggy. That's doom for, for, rose, for uh, lavenders. Uh, they're, they're pretty unforgiving. So, so put them in an area that's really draining real well, and then uh, water them deep, and then try to neglect them some. They'll, they'll tend to thrive more. My best lavenders have been in containers. I've got this beautiful red, oxblood red container. 
got lavender that's ginormous and it's been in there for years and it's a showpiece. I mean, you could put it in front of a museum. It's that pretty, it's beautiful. Uh, but it's because it's got potting soil, drains really well. And then it's just, it's just draining well. And so I just treat it like all the other flowers in the front yard. It's on this automatic system, but this one happens to be variegated. So usually lavender is blue or silver foliage. This one's got, we figured out how to put a gold variegation to it. Just funky, I get bored with plants. And so we're going, oh, that's neat. Let's try that one. Oh, it works really well. It's the same blue flower. It's about this big, kind of mound shape, has some blue flowers on it. Uh, but most of your lavenders are gonna do really well here. If you don't know where to start, start with English lavender. It's the hardiest of all of them. Then go to French. It's the next hardiest. Then go to Spanish. Spanish is the least hardy. Now Spanish will go down to about 10 degrees, which we rarely go below 10 degrees, but some years it can, and then it'll wipe out those, but the other, the other ones will live. So just kind of some, just some things I've learned. I've lost a couple plants, harsh winters, and we're due for a harsh winter. We need a sub-zero winter. So it's about time, about every 10, 50, it's been about 12 years since we've gone that cold. This is for you, Phoenix folks, Palm Springs. Oops, can you see it? Here you go. Here you folks online. This is just for you. Can you see the, see the figs on there? My mouth's watering just thinking about them. So figs can grow up here, but they're not going to grow like they grow down the desert. They don't turn into trees. They're going to be more like a big shrub. They're going to be, there we go. It's about, let's see, 10, 30, a little bit early. It's an hour early today. Good deal. So um, what I find is I grow mine in a container because I want that Mediterranean. I've got, I've got a grape. I've got a, a fig in a container, big green, like jade colored pot. And then I've got creeping thyme over the sides. So I wanted that Mediterranean. I'm trying to create art with my container gardens. And I wanted figs and thyme, just kind of, that's a classic. And so what I do is in the winter, I pull it next to the house and the house throws off enough heat, it just insulates it and it goes right through just fine. I have grown them in the ground as well. They're equal as hardy because the ground just naturally insulates them. But what will happen is frequently the winter will kill off the top section and it will relief from the ground like a perennial and it'll grow an extra, it'll grow four or five feet one year, just <clears throat> instantly turns into this multi-trunked heavy producing fig plant, not tree. We don't grow fig trees. You just don't see trees up here because of that winter phenomena that happens. That and also pick out, this is Chicago hardy fig. It's, it, it takes the cold better than some of the other varieties. So, but there's several, we've got a new uh, dwarf variety. It's made for containers. So now you can bring it in a greenhouse or you can just leave it on the patio next to the house and it'll come back for you every year. And it still puts on that great big, same big fig. If you like figs, it seems like figs you either love or you hate. There's no in between ground with them. Boy, there's nothing, gosh, they just taste like candy when they're coming out of your, when they come off the, the bush. Same with pomegranates. Pomegranates, you can grow. There's a couple varieties that are hardy enough. This is a deciduous plant. It's going to lose its foliage in the winter. I thought it had some here. It's got a pomegranate just starting. It's got a bright red flower. So it's really pretty as far as a foliage. Just the plant itself is beautiful. Bright red flowers in spring, but then it starts to form these. This will turn into a fruit like this, bright red, pomegranate. It does really well. Again, they don't grow as big as they do, let's say down in Tucson or some of the desert areas. But this is a big, it'll easily get up to, I don't know, four to five foot high and bushy, not a tree form. So again, it'll grow in the ground, in a pot, wherever you want it. If you're growing in containers, I brought this one for that as an example. This would be the minimum size container. I try to grow a little bit larger myself because I've got big, I've got huge patios. I'm trying to soften all this paver stuff. So. It's, it's a beautiful entertainment area, spas, hot tubs, grills, but it's big. So I'm using containers. I'm trying to use, I don't know, 18 inch, this kind of size and this deep, just to soften up all that hardscape. Again, it looks, if it's too much block and brick and stuff, it feels off and you don't know why. It's probably because there's not enough plants. 
And so, but this would be a good size. And I brought it for this plant. We're trying to introduce more dwarf varieties. This is a dwarf. This is called zestful lollipop grape. It's half the size of a regular grape vine. So it's made for containers, raised beds, next to the patio, where it just isn't gonna grow past the patio and up over the roof, which is what most grapes do. This is gonna keep its bound much better, yet you still get those great big red, it's a real pretty taste, it just really tastes good red grape. But it's made for containers. You can grow containers. I've got over 50 pots in my yard. The insider tip is in the winter. If you hear a cold snap coming, make sure you go, you know what it is. You know, oh, storm's coming from there. Oh my God, it's gonna be so cold. Everyone heads to the grocery store. They wipe out the grocery store. You know, the shelves are emptied. You know, it's a Prescottonian thing. I don't know why we do that. We're gonna run out for the two days that we have snow. But if you hear that kind of storm coming, go water your plants. A hydrated plant goes through the cold much better than a dry plant. If the plant is damaged, it's going to be a dry, it was in a container, it was dry, and then it got real cold. It got down to 22 degrees. And that's when you're going to get burned. We call it winter burn or winter kill. So it'll burn back the plants. And so just water them. And it'll be, it's a game changer. You just, it's going to keep that antifreeze. It's naturally within the structure, even if they're, even if they're hibernating underground. Let's say it's a perennial. Um, so water it. Because that hydrated root will, will go through that cold far better than a dry plant. It's kind of counterintuitive because if you and I get wet, we get colder, not with a plant. They get warmer. Okay. How much, how much sun do so all these things we've been talking about, so this question is how much sun? I would say at least six hours of sun or more is ideal. It's going to need sunshine to produce all the sugars to make all this fruit. So they're, they're kind of, it doesn't take... Most folks say full sun. Our sun is so intense, and even in the shade, it's a bright shade. They're still picking up uh, photosynthesis, even in the shaded areas. So some of my best gardens are underneath the trees, where they get sun in the morning, you know, first dawn through about, I don't know, 10 or 11, get a little bit of shade, and then they get sun from two to end of the day. Magical gardens. My east side of the house grows my best herbs, and I've tried all over the yard. East side, it gets sun from dawn till about noon, and then it has shade the rest of the day. But it's a bright shade. It's still out there. It's right there. It's not protected by trees. It's just out there against the house. I've got it down these steps. We've got a classic mountain house, beautiful views overlooking the dells. Well, it's like, I don't know, it's like 80 feet from the top to the bottom of the, to the yard. Beautiful vistas, but we've got terraces and, and uh, raised beds going up and down the, the yard. So the stairs get from the driveway to the backyard is it's at least a story, if not a couple extra steps. So every step has got a different kind of herb on the east side. Magical. Every time I want an herb, I just go walk outside from the kitchen, walk around, pick off whatever I want, and take it in. So tomatoes are coming off right now. I love a little bit of, I don't know, vinegar and basil. And just, I could eat that all day long. Every day I could eat that. Every day I do eat that. And so that's what I'll do from now through, through autumn. So fresh, fresh. There's nothing better than fresh. So yeah, great question. At least six hours plus. The more sun, generally the better. I mean, let me cover uh, berries just real quick so I don't, I don't miss this one. I know I'm going to... There's two I want to hit with you. I've got 10 minutes and we'll be into an hour. Strawberries do amazingly well here. I don't think we use strawberries enough. Uh, we always say, ground, I need a ground cover. Why not strawberries? They grow, they put on a runner, they, 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 they touch the ground, they put another plant on, then they, they just run across the yard. And so I've got some big strawberry patches that I planted only a few berries and now they're starting to grow, they're filling in the yard. So I've got a pond in the backyard, waterfall goes into a fairly large, fairly large pond, but then when it rains, I'm rain harvesting from the roof to fill up the ponds, I'm trying to reduce water use but it overflows the overflow. I've got an overflow pond below the pond just to take all the extra that happens flow. I put berries in there. And then I surround it with blue lime grass. It's grass with this berry patch. It's a piece of art, it's beautiful. Uh, but I just, I don't water it. I don't take care of it. It just grows because it's like the perfect spot for, for berries like that. I'll use uh, um, strawberries often. That's front edge of raised beds or in containers. So I've got a, a peach tree in a very large pot, about this big, stands about this big. 
big tree, big, big peaches. And on the edges, I mean, just a tree in a pot looks kind of, it's not quite, I needed an underplanting, it needs to be softened. And so I put strawberries and they just spill over the edges and I was having strawberries last night from that. Just a few plants fills up. So I think we can think outside the box. We can think of fruiting plants, edible plants as, as, as decorative and as edible. You can have both. I think in our, in our smaller plot lots especially, uh, we can have both. Okay, so that's why I brought this. Just strawberries plus I know gardeners, you all are easy. Look, strawberries. Aren't you excited? Yep. Okay, blueberries, let's cover that. A little bit different. Hey, Ken, can we get the folks online to the blueberry handout? That would be, that would help them too. So, and I'll also make sure you all get that too. So if you put your name on that, you'll have the blueberry handout. Um, blueberries grow naturally where there's boggy, acidy, peaty type of gardens. That's everything that Arizona is not. So you need to be a little more of a gardener to grow blueberries. I've had great success in containers. Berries, blueberries are beautiful plants. It's a very pretty, very balanced, full, just, just a handsome plant. And then it puts on this bell-shaped flower and then a berry, it's just kind of, kind of got everything to it. Uh, so I'm using containers mainly so that I can plant it in potting soil. Potting soil is peat moss. That's the main ingredient and a lot of organic uh, compost stuff. So it's very acidic. And peat, uh, potting soils are made to drain faster. So you get this good drainage. You don't get that. What blueberries don't like is that mineral buildup that gets in your sink or your bathtub. You know, that white spotting, that builds up in your soil too. They hate that. And so a looser soil helps flush that stuff out. And so if you don't, if you plant it right in the ground, it would grow, but it would, you'll, be, you'll struggle to keep it green, fruiting. Uh, it'll just always want to go yellow on you. There's some ways to compensate for that by giving it more acidic kind of soils or, or uh, foods. And I brought one for you, aluminum sulfate. These acid lovers love that. This is the most acidy thing you can get on there without vaporizing the foliage right off. Uh, aluminum sulfate is it's sulfides, so it's sulfur lowers the pH and makes things acidic. Aluminum brings the color out. So we mainly use this for evergreens. Uh, uh, Colorado spruce, Fat Albert spruce, hoop size, these uh, silver colored evergreens, that's usually aluminum showing up on the foliage. You can rub it right off actually. If you take a blue spruce and rub the foliage, you'll see that blue come off. So that's why they kind of revert back to green after a while. They don't have enough if they don't keep it more acidic and have some aluminum to it, it'll just turn green. So there's ways to trick it into becoming more colorful. This is what we use on uh, hydrangeas to keep that flower bright and blue. Otherwise, it kind of revert to pink. Well, blueberries kind of like that too. So kind of be careful with that. But again, a little bit goes a long way or you can damage. So this kind of stuff, I say put a little bit on, see how it does. You can always put more on. If you put too much, you can't take it off. So kind of with fertilizers, be careful. I brought that mainly for if you want brighter colored evergreens, aluminum sulfate, and for things that love acid, aluminum sulfate, okay? Blueberries, plant them in containers, put them in potting soil. I think you could easily go in, in raised beds and just front load it, that soil, that area with potting soil. It gets kind of confusing. Let's just explain this real quick. You walk up to the wall of dirt and grime at Home Depot. They've got, what, 100 foot by 12 feet tall. And they're, which one? They all say they're garden soil and potting soil and potting mix. And which one? There's basically only three kinds of soils you're ever going to find at any garden center. It always starts with manure, poop in a bag. Literally, at Depot, they just connect it to the end of the cow and they fill it up and it's gooey and gross and smelly and stinky and just it's, it's disgusting. Ours, we actually compost and mix it with some, some, so it's deodorized. The last thing I want to do is take a huge bag of manure and put it in the back of your Lexus. It stinks it up for the next week. That's just, that's offensive. That's not why you're shopping here. So we're trying to go extra, the extra mile for you. So poop. Uh, there's, different, there's different kinds of poop. Basic is variations of chicken or mainly cow poop because cows put on mountains of poop. You're going to have topsoil. 
Topsoil is usually the heaviest of the mixes. It's usually there to fill in divots. Probably it's got a lot of sand in it. So our topsoil that we make, we make our own soils, it's our compost, and we put about 20% sand in it. Because we know some of you live up on ridge tops where like the wind is so strong, it blows the soil away. If you put anything else up there, it'll just blow away. So this helps keep it filled in. It's not made to really plant in. It's too heavy, mainly. It's just too, it doesn't drain fast enough. It's made to fill in a hole. I dug a hole and I pulled out a boulder and I need to put some stuff back in there. It's made for that. I need to raise my raised bed up some. I need something a little bit less expensive that just fills it up quick. Topsoil, that's what that's for. Then you get into compost, or we call it mulch, premium, premium mulch. We've got a sawmill up in Taylor, Arizona that we've got access to. It's got a 50-year-old saw tailings. We screen that down to quarter inch minus. So it's, it's, we've got filters, we just screen everything down. And so it's composted, rich, dark. So if you folks in the Midwest, mulch means um, basically bark chips. It's not that. It's composted wood products is what that is. And so that's, it's made specifically to plant new plants in. Because we know you got terrible soil, and so you're gonna dig all this clay out, you're gonna chuck out all the rocks, anything bigger than a golf ball, you should screen out, it's gonna be nothing but bad in the summer. It heats up and just water molecules can attach to, bar to larger par particles. You need to screen that out. Um, and so you, what's left over, you're gonna add mulch, usually about 25% to 75% soil. You can cheat it, you can go 50-50, but then it gets too, too, it stays too gooey. It's made to keep that clay from compacting right back down. Or it's made to keep that granity soil up by Granite Mountain. You get that layer of 18 inch layer of granite and then hard pan underneath. It's made to keep that, basically a sand, to keep moisture up around the roots so it doesn't dry out as fast. It's made to actually increase worm count. Uh, organics bring in the beneficials that start. The last one, so, so we got manure, topsoil, mulch. The last one is potting soil. So our grower put together our recipe, potting soils are a recipe, uh, and it's, this is a difficult area to get the soil right. So it's like a razor's edge. So you want a soil that will drain, but will also hold moisture. That's a challenge, especially when it's drier out. And so we've been trying this recipe, tweaking it for a lot of years. So it's peat moss, some, some of our mulch in it. It's got perlite, there's little white specks and stuff in it. It's got the more, it's got the more expensive ingredients. It's got a 555 organic fertilizer in it. So, so it's made to plant directly into. Don't mix it, don't cut it, fill a pot up, plant it right in there and go. It's made for that. And a lot of our, our starts are grown in water's potting soil. If you simply take a plant from us and put it in more of, our, more of the stuff that it knows automatically, it's gonna go, wow, this is great, more room. Plants do not like different kinds of soil. They don't like going from this rich, thick soil to Oh my gosh, clay, what is this? I don't know what's going on. They're going to freak out. They're going to go into transplant shock when they do that. So if you can mitigate some of that by adding some organics, there's different philosophies on this. We happen to believe you need to introduce some organics into your, into your gardens, into your soils, so it can encourage, it can activate your soil so they start to grow roots. Okay, But, but berries are really going to benefit from potting, so we screw, go right back around for five minutes ago. Plant and potting soil, you'll be happier. Okay, so with that, I'm done with the talk on berries. Oh, fruit trees, we gotta cover that. So we do not grow citrus, we do not grow avocados. Take that off the plate. You're just not gonna have those. That's Phoenix, that's desert. We're not a desert. Why would you live 10 miles from the sun? It's awful, it's, it's like it'll be 105 today and muggy. Up here it's gonna be 80 and beautiful and it might rain. It'll be chilly tonight. Here's where you grow apples, pears. You're gonna grow peaches, apricots, nectarines, plums, persimmons, uh, nuts. We only grow one nut really at this elevation. It's, it's almonds. Pecans, you'll hear rumors of pecans, but really that's gonna be Skull Valley and lower, 4,000 foot level and lower. They really don't, they'll grow up here, but they won't produce fruit up here or very limited nuts or very inconsistent. A beautiful tree, but it won't produce, if you're planting a, a, a nut tree, you're gonna want nuts. Otherwise, plant a maple or something else. Um, so those, that's kind of your sequence. If you're gonna start, start with apples and pears. 
The reason you want to start with those fruits as far as tree form goes, now this is, again, a 25-foot tree by, by 20 foot wide. This is, a, this is a tree that forms apples. Pick your favorite, Honeycrisp, Fuji, Yellow Delicious, Macintosh. They're all probably going to do well up here. There's a couple desert varieties that won't, so Desert uh, Delight, there's a couple of them. Just if it has the word desert in it, you probably don't want it up here. But the reason you want apples and pears first, they're the last ones to bloom in spring. So you're getting out of that risk of, of frost damage. So that's why. So you'd be more consistent with apples and pears. From there, you're going to probably cherries and peaches. They're the next one to produce pretty regularly, pretty often. And so there you're going to want varieties that are more cold hardy. So, so with fruits, and I got a whole class on nothing but fruit trees in the spring, so I'm going to condense this right down for you. But there's chilling hours. So, so fruit trees are programmed after so many nights below hours below freezing, bloom. They're just they're programmed, preset. It's DNA. And so we're looking for fruits, the trees that have a larger or higher chilling hours. So don't go below 700 chilling hours. So if you're doing your research, 650, 700, the desert varieties need 200 because they don't get any frost down there. They're just going to bloom up here. They would bloom. They go into full fruit, fruit mode by the end of January, February. Well, we've got three more months of frost. What are the chances that thing's going to keep that fruit without being damaged? Zero. Down the desert, it's going to be much, much better. So up here, we're looking for varieties that bloom later. Then you'd probably start with apricots and nectarines. Well, plums, if you love plums, like, like uh, uh, Santa Rosa's, I mean, there's nothing like a fresh plum. I mean, my, I'm a Southern boy, so my mama gave me the salt shaker. I'd go out and green plums with salt on them. I love that. And so it's kind of a weird thing. I know it's a Southern thing, but I love plums. And so you can grow plums very, very well up here. Uh, they're going to they're going to be in that peach road, kind of that middle of the road. They bloom early, but not as early as apricots and nectarines. So if you're going to start with apples and pears, then peaches and cherries, then go to plums, then lastly, everyone wants to start with apricots. I love fresh apricots. They're so expensive in the store. I know. Apricots are a feast or famine kind of fruit. You either have so many, you better be ready with the canners, the dryers. You better have friends, extra bags, because there'll be so much fruit, you know what to do with it, or none. So they get frosted. This year they got frosted out. We had two major frost events that took the fruits. So they had fruits on them, and that cold in, in April just came in and just froze them all. There's no recovery from that. It's not going to re... You don't have a chance for fruits again until next spring. So, and I'll send you the charts. Now, we get into uh, most of your pitted fruits are self-pollinating. One tree will do it. So peaches just needs one tree, just one red Alberta, one ranger, one, one white peach. It will, fruit, it will pollinate itself. Male and female are the same plant. Apples are not that way. You need two. To really do pears, you need two. Cherries, typically you need two. Oh, they'll produce better with twos. So you'll have that chart, which fruits pollinate which. We also have them on the end of the tree racks because you won't bring that form with you when you come in going, I've done my homework. Well, we also print it right here for us and for you to kind of go, did I get the right one? The next question that always comes up with is how close do the fruit trees need to be within eye shot? They can be anywhere in the yard. Just don't put a barn or a house in between them or a shed. Just keep them where bees are not very smart. But if they can fly and see it, they're going right for it. They just go, nope, where's the next tree? Jump, they go right for it. So just put them in line of sight and you're good. And that includes neighbors. If you've got neighbors down the street that have fruit trees, that's fair game. You can use their tree to pollinate for you. In fact, if you've got several trees in the neighborhood, probably the bees are traveling around helping you pollinate. But if you've got a tree you planted there, it's your pear, and next year it fruited, and it, we didn't get a frost, it's in full bloom, and it didn't fruit, that's probably a pollination thing. It just it needs two to kind of make it go. Some, like Bartlett's, will fruit some by themselves. The fruits will be larger if you get a buddy, uh, but, but sometimes you'll get some fruit on them, and it can't be the same kind of fruit, so you can't go red to Honeycrisp. They need to be a Honeycrisp and something different. So it'll be a Fuji, it's just about Honeycrisp is pretty good at pollinating all the other fruits and vice versa. So you need two different varieties. So it can't be two Bing cherries, 
needs to be a black tartarian and a Bing. They pollinate each other. Big, sweet, red cherry. Okay, so that makes, so again, you'll have that handout to you. It's like a five page document on here's all the apples, here's what pollinates. So we try to put the locals, the ones that grow up here that have proven themselves, we put those fruits on the list and then you know how to, how to cross pollinate. Does that make sense? Questions on that? You're starting to get that dazed look going, too much information, too much information. Oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. We're here, we're hanging out too. Let me just go over a couple things that are not related that I think are important to, to uh, I'm seven minutes over. Let me just give me five more minutes, but I think it'll help you with your tomatoes, that kind of stuff. So right now we're getting customers coming in with blossom end rot. There's where the, where the flower was touching the fruit. We're getting this black spot. That is a classic calcium deficiency. That is what's gonna cause that. And the reason is you've been watering like crazy through June, first part of July. And so we flushed all the nutrients out of the gardens, out of the soils that we put in last March and April. Those, those nutrients are now gone. The plant is left wanting uh, calcium basically. You can up the game with calcium. So what do you do? Calcium nitrate. I'm sprinkling some of that around the base. It's granular. So it's, it's probably the fastest releasing calcium you can give to a tomato plant. I do it for my peppers. I grow giant pumpkins. Giant pumpkins love, I mean, you want to impress grandkids, grow a pumpkin that you have to use a wheelbarrow to get up to the front, front, front of the house. They're, they're awestruck. We don't grow 1,000 pound, or I don't grow 1,000 pound pumpkins, but an 80 pounder will do just fine. It's bigger than you get at the grocery store. Well, they like calcium. So that's something you can do. And I'll do this every couple of months or so. Just, you'll get bigger fruits. Again, better flavor out of your calciums. And then in addition, I'm spraying yield booster on the foliage. This is liquid calcium. I know I'm gonna have calcium deficiency. I know it's gonna show up if I don't do this. Your, your yard is more than likely gonna see the same thing. That, there's nothing like going a tomato this big and half of it's rotted. That's just offensive. This keeps that from going. So every year I just buy a bottle of this yield booster, it's liquid. Calcium, I spritz the foliage, not the fruit. Don't focus on the fruit. The plant's gonna take it in through the foliage mass, not, not, the, not the roots from the foliage. I do that every couple of, year, couple of weeks. Actually, I'll get one of these each. This is what I, okay, my name's Ken. We're just friends. This is what I do, and it really, I've got so many tomatoes. I've got four plants. I don't know what I'm gonna do with all the fruit. I, I'm actually worried. Actually, I'm not. I got a whole crew I can bring them into, and they'll love them. Um, but, but one week I'm spraying um, Blossom Set, the next week I spray Yield Booster. And I just, every week, on the weekend, typically Sundays, I go and I just sip coffee and I talk to my plants. And I spritz the foliage with one of these. So if you're not getting a lot of fruit on the plant, that's, that's Blossom Set, it's not pollinating well. And so this actually forces more of the flowers to set fruits. So Yield, you folks online, tomato and pepper set. It also works on not just tomatoes and peppers, it can work on, I spritz my cucumbers, helps seems to bring that out too. And then yield booster is liquid calcium. This is for the blossom end rot. Or if you've got squash, and that squash started to form, and then it just turned yellow and fell off. Yield, the yield booster is gonna help that, get rid of that issue. Okay, so those, those are two really quick trips, tricks that'll help you like immediately. What else did I bring up here? Superphosphate, I'm put it, giving to certain plants. Not so much my vegetable garden because the vegetables have such rich soil already, but my uh, Russian sage, the summer bloomers, crepe myrtles, uh, my uh, autumn sage, a little red, a uh, little knee-high shrub that gets red flowers on it, hummingbirds like. I'm giving a handful of superphosphate just over the, over the ground. Uh, on the ground, I don't work it in. Again, the, the book says, we, we Google, make sure you put it in the ground. I find you don't have to do that. Just get it on while the rains are coming. It's gonna get in the soil and this is zero, 18, zero. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potash. Phosphorus is what brings out flowers. If you want more, another set of roses, superphosphate. You want more brighter, richer blue on your Russian sage, more uh, roses, Sharon, the hibiscus flowers. You want more of that, superphosphate is what, what does that. So, and I'm taking advantage of the rain. Just some, some things I'm doing right now for my own gardens. What else did I put up here? Bugs, bugs, bugs. Triple action. This is what we're gonna spray that spittle bug with. 
Oh, you got it. Perfect. Yeah, you're ready to go, aren't you? You know the class almost over. You want to kill that little, little guy, don't you? Now, hold on. <laughs> um, triple action is neem oil. It's my go-to first line defense for anything in the edible gardens because you can spray this up to the day of harvest. It's completely organic and safe for things like ladybugs, that kind of stuff, but it'll obliterate spittlebug, uh, all your aphids, uh, ciliads, and all those little tiny flying things that float around. Plus, I always get powdery mildew on my pumpkins and squash. This, there's this white powder that coats the foliage. I know it's coming. And so this is really good. If you can catch powdery mildew early, it coats the spore and doesn't let it spread. So I can, I can control that organically. Otherwise, you're moving up to much harsher things in the garden. And I don't like that for my vegetable. Out in the flower garden, it's different than my vegetable gardens. I want to keep it organic as much as I can. So, okay, with that, I think I'm done. Question, I knew there'd be, I knew there'd be a, just some questions. We'll go for it. Go for it. Yep. Um, going back to the pomegranate. Yep. Oh, so, so if I heard you right, so let me help you with your folks online. Again, we're trying not to forget you. We know you're tuned in. Um, so her question is, this fruit, when it gets big enough, is it going to do this? Is that right? Um, well, also, the, the stem's going to get stimmer, stiffer too, but sometimes I do actually put little bamboo things. If it's starting to do that, I'll put a piece of bamboo and just keep it sturdy or keep it up there. Yeah. As this is a young tree... So as the tree matures, it'll get stiffer and stiffer or sturdier branches. You won't have to do that. So, yep, that's a good question, actually. But things that grow so fast, peonies, the flowers are huge. Sometimes they just need some bamboo stakes or tomato. I like uh, tomato cages for more than just tomatoes. My tomato cages, you won't come to my house and see plain, like galvanized. Mine are spray painted colors. They're art. I put two on top of each other because some of my tomatoes are taller than I am now. So I'm stacking them up. I'm putting stakes in them to help them. I'm trying to control this. This is gardening. This is how you do it. You just to, as a plant expresses a need, the gardener responds and helps them just kind of helps them from don't sag so much, you poor thing. Let me help you, bamboo. So it kind of does that. That's actually a good question, especially as next year this is going to have, you know, 20 fruits on it. So this is still a youngster. When, you have, when it has a bunch of fruit, it really is, it's beautiful, but it can really be laden with a lot of fruit. Same with apples. You can get so many apples. Sometimes you've got to notch a two-by-four and kind of hold up the, uh, the branches. They're so heavy. Peaches, the same way. They're so heavy. So there's, things, there's tricks you can do that, that help the plant not, not hurt itself. Do you recommend taking some of those apples? Yeah, you do thin it. We'll teach that in the winter class. How do you thin? But you shouldn't have more than two or three fruits on each cluster. You know, apples will have five, six, seven. So I'll, th I'll thin off all, but usually for me too, it's painful to do this because you're picking off apples. I'll take the weakest ones. I want those out of there. So I keep the strongest one or two. And then those will turn into this beautiful big, then there's separate bugs for those, which you don't have time for, cuddling moth, all these things. So that's more of a, a winter class. We've got other classes that we cover that. Or we can go so offline and just kind of help you. We do this all day long, just talking one-on-one -on -one with gardeners. We can do that for you anytime. So if you've got other questions, okay. What else? Was something over here? Got it? Well, I will let you clap online first, just because the actor in me says, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Okay. And then look for those handouts to you shortly. Um, then anything else, I'll hang out here and just answer questions with you as long as you want. Okay, thanks for coming, you all. From my yard, that was yeah, from my yard to my driveway, and so it angled this way, and yep. I just finished terracing. Nice, beautiful, so you'll love it. But we want to do a tree.